So welcome to our first ever chosen review. I believe we're getting into season five now or for season six. Uh, so late to the game, but I think that uh, we just kind of got into it. Uh, Marley, you've been into it with your grandmother for, for a little bit. I watched it a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But I just kind of got into it. So I thought it would be interesting to go through um, our, our episode by episode guide and hopefully see, see what's going on in each episode as well as tie it into different biblical verses and have some discussion around the topics that, that go on. So The Chosen has been a huge, huge hit amongst um, not just Christians, but a, a lot of people uh, just because of the quality of writing and the quality of production. I believe it has almost 70 million viewers uh, at different points. So they definitely hit hit it out of the park. I think that when when I see this, I think it's so popular because, as you know, Marla, there are so much Christian content that is terrible out there. Very cheesy. Kind of <laughs> makes you embarrassed. <laughs> exactly. I feel like for The Chosen, the best like content was maybe veggie tales <laughs> yeah something like that i'm thinking of uh there was this kirk cameron movie about the rapture uh it was like the former child uh actor and i mean just the acting the special effects everything was so so bad davy and goliath was probably a good representation too. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, what is it the passion of the christ was mm. a little bit like a horror movie. Like I know my grandma has never watched it. Like as yeah, much never watched it. It's kind of scary and it starts with like almost like a demon or something. So it's like I don't know. Like like that's not really what a lot of like Christians are looking for. <laughs> I almost get squeamish even just reading through the gospels when you start to get to that point when Jesus gets arrested and crucified. Like I, I, I almost don't like it. Obviously that's the most, probably the most important part of the story is the resurrection and, and um, you know, the forgiveness of sins that came from that. But I almost don't even like to read those parts. So I can't imagine just watching a movie of that worst part for and the an hour. And everything is just yeah. intense. And then uh, I know he got in trouble with kind of being a lot of Jewish stereotypes. <laughs> But uh, we'll get into that. So, our, our <laughs> unless uh, I think we both uh, are very ADHD, so <laughs> every episode runs the risk of being five hours, and we're talking about okay, you we'll know up later. the the Book of Enoch. Uh, <laughs> before, oh well, before. speaking of, <laughs> <laughs> we I do have I I do actually have something at the end of this touching uh that so our first episode starts with what we see is a little girl and she's with her father and she's afraid and she's scared and doesn't uh know what to do and when she talks to her dad he says what do we do when we're afraid and he recites Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus say the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he had formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. So this is something that uh, her dad has explained to her uh, over the years, and What's interesting about this to, to go into, uh, I think, a relevant tangent is that a lot of people didn't have Taurus. Uh, and that day you would probably be calling it uh, the laws and the prophets, which broke it down like the, um, the laws would be your mosaic laws the laws that came from moses and then the later books would be these books of prophets that we'll get into uh as well and it, uh, and isaiah would be in this prophet section so for most of these people they're illiterate at this time in the world so people didn't have uh any need to actually have a tour because they wouldn't be able to read it if they did the, the vast majority of people very simple uh, times where these people were almost nomadic and they didn't just carry this this thing. Uh, there would probably be Torahs in synagogues uh, at this point, but 
that was very rare that you would go there. Sometimes you would only go to a synagogue for one, once or twice a year, depending on the reasons. So it would be common that these families would pass on these stories orally. Um, and uh, and um, so, Marley, do you know where synagogues kind of came from? Like what, what it first meant? No, I have no idea. So when the Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem that had their holy temple, they had no holy uh, place to go. So synagogue just means a gathering place, a community place. So while in exile, these popped up away from the main temple in Jerusalem. And for instance, during the Babylonian exile, and people would go to these as kind of a makeshift temple and go. But for the most part, everybody comes and they, uh, they have these oral recitations. Um, so now our next scene comes in and the woman is older. I think that we're meant to figure it was her. I think they do something like in cinema when you zoom in on a little girl's face and then they're older uh, or, or something. But keep in mind, we don't know who she is at this point. If if you can recall, I know you've seen all these episodes a million times. Did you did you know who it was? We won't spoil it yet. No, but I mean, I figured it was like one of the main women. There's only like a couple. <laughs> yeah, can I, I? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I figured it was one of the Marys. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Almost all of the major characters here, women, are just Mary. It's like it makes it right? less confusing, I guess. You know, Mary. It's like how every American was Joe in the, in the World Wars or so. But she's in trouble. Um, we don't know exactly what, what happened. And she is reciting those exact words from Isaiah. So you can see that it stuck with her you know, for the most part. And then the next scene we see is Matthew, who is a tax collector. And he's going around the city and... Everybody hates him. He also seems like he's a bit of a uh, germaphobe. What do you think about his um, his presentation here as Matthew? Because you don't really learn that much about the apostles. I guess Simon or Peter, you have kind of the most in text. But I almost get the impression that he's autistic coded. <laughs> right? That there's I something about that. But yeah, I feel like. It, I don't know, like in the Bible, they find a good way of getting different personality quirks in all of the disciples. And it's like, even if you're neurotic or like you're like antisocial or whatever, like he's like the not normal one, I guess. Yeah, I think just reading the book of Matthew, it is so detailed that you'd imagine that the person who would write that would have the, that real attention to detail that we see um, constantly with him. Now, tax collectors were very different back then. Uh, right now, we have the IRS, who we absolutely hate, unless they're watching this video, and then you guys are <laughs> terrific. But, we have nothing to hide. Yeah, we have nothing to hide, and we uh, we think you guys do a great job, and damn, everything. So the this is almost worse than the IRS. This is the IRS if it had a third party in the middle. So... If you can imagine a country takes over your country and then they're all the way over there and they send soldiers and then some of your neighbors start a job where their job is to collect money from you to give to that foreign country. And they didn't get paid, so they increased the number of how much you owe so that they would be able to make a living off it as their job. And you can imagine how much you would dislike your neighbor. I mean, whether or not you're, uh, you know, a Democrat or Republican, um, we justify a certain amount of taxes because in theory, doesn't always work like this, in theory, that money is going to your society to make it a little bit better. And like, I, that's the ideal situation. Or at least keep it running or something. Yeah, not so much in our country, but 
<laughs> in America, but in theory, you'd have social programs that help people out. Those countries like Denmark or Norway, where every parent gets ten thousand dollars when they have a baby, we get to pay them ten thousand dollars, even if we have insurance. Yeah. And, and then uh, they would give baskets, they give medicine. So you can imagine we're almost in this situation minus the third party that you no, know, the taxes come and they go all the way over to Rome so they can go on adventures and, and do whatever, uh, whatever they plan. So you can imagine when you see people being upset with Matthew, that's why he's almost viewed as a traitor. And this is why throughout the Bible, when you hear people say to Jesus, how could you be the Holy one? You hang out tax collectors. Um, it, th this is why. And for that reason, because they are hated, Matthew ends up meeting up with a guy he knows, a Roman soldier whose name is Gaius. And he's something of a bodyguard at this point in time, that he'd sit around while Matthew's in his little stall and collecting taxes and just make sure nobody kills Matthew. Or beats him up and you know steals the money. That that's why that's why he's uh, here at this end. But it does show you how how strange the choices of the apostles are uh, with them. And we'll get more into that because that's a theme amongst pretty much every one of them. Now the next person you see is Simon and his brother Andrew. And they're talking about money struggles. They had purchased a boat so they could be fishermen and go out, but they're not doing well. They're in massive debt and at risk of losing their boat. And so if they lose that, they can't even make money. So it's uh, it's really a bad situation um, that, that they're in here. And Simon says to his brother that he is going to fish on Shabbat. Because Rome doesn't waste the time patrolling on that day because they assume that most Jews aren't going to fish. On Shabbat, uh, the Jews don't do um, any work. So if Simon's able to fish there and make some money, he's making more money because he doesn't have to give um, that. And this is where we get our first reference to a big character where Andrew, his brother, doesn't like it and... Simon asks him if you're going to tell your bug-eating friend about it. <laughs> and that's referring to uh, John the Baptist, who, who we get to see uh, a lot more. Um, John is running his own, not a synagogue, but he's running this, people come to him in the wilderness, and he's baptizing them, and he is giving them lessons, and um, and. and and just kind of teaching them uh, his ver version of the religion. So um, you were just at um, church recently, and they were talking about John the Baptist, right? Yeah. Isn't Jesus and John the Baptist the cousins, right? Yes. Yeah. They, they, they would have, like, technically, like, grown up, like, seeing each other. Yeah. Yeah, you would imagine. Um, so, uh, yeah, so... so John's parents are Elizabeth and Zachariah, who are related to Mary. Um, and they have an interesting story, too. Might not be as miraculous as Jesus, but uh, Elizabeth is very, very old. Like, I don't know what old would have been at that time, but you figure 50, 60 is well past the point that she would have a child. And like Mary was visited with an, by an angel and told that she's going to have a son that's going to lead the way uh, for, for Jesus in this miraculous thing. So it was, it was within this small family uh, that, that all these things were happening. So I think you could assume that they knew each other for the most uh, part. I, because Jesus was a craftsman and apprenticing for his father, uh, you also have to remember when Jesus goes to Egypt with his parents to, to hide from Herod. And then uh, while all that's going on, John is going into uh, near the River Jordan. He's in this very abandoned place that not a lot of people go. So 
you know, they, they didn't have phones back then. So, yeah, I think it's safe to say that they were familiar with each other, but their lives went very different uh, paths. What's kind of cool is that Zachariah, uh, John's father, was within the priest class. And throughout the Old Testament, even, uh, for instance, in, um, in Samuel, 1 Samuel, you, you get a good lesson that people who offer sacrifices really need to be priests. Uh, the first king of Israel, Saul, Saul, gets into a lot of trouble when he picks the sacrifice and performs it instead of waiting um, for, for Samuel to do it. And you now we get all the way to this, and this is jumping um, you know, to fall pretty far, but John, as a in the priest class, is somewhat the one that offers Jesus as the sacrifice. And um, that's what he means by the, the Lamb of God when he, fir when he first meets him. So it really ties back because he would have had that priestly blood to be able to name it as a sacrifice, the biggest sacrifice uh, in, in history. The leaders of the church also were mad because he wasn't technically a church leader and he was going around baptizing people. And he's like, what gives you the right to do it? So knowing that he did have like it in his family, it makes sense. It's like I could have been, I just chose yeah. it this way instead. Exactly. They, you know, Rome was in control of this area, but it still had this religious order uh, of the Jewish people in, in that time who were primarily responsible for administering law uh, unless, you know, uh, any, any kind of sin or any kind of crime that was based on the laws and the prophets. So they were even able to make up a ton of different laws, uh, which they called the Mishnah at that point. Um, and so they were able to make laws that didn't have anything to do with religious text. And they were able to administer it, and they were getting money from Rome to kind of take care of things. They were getting taxes from the people in the same way that Rome was. So they just had a good thing going. And so when anybody was stirring up trouble and questioning their authority, they were getting very, very upset um, with it. Uh, do you want to hear a funny example of kind of one of the man-made laws that they came up with? Yes. That's impact that's impacted my life. <laughs> so um, for, for Passover, um, you have, you got to clean the whole house, right? From all these breadcrumbs and everything. And then you get two different sets of plates, um, one for meat and one for dairy. And you can't ever mix them. They can't even be cleaned together. And then you, if you keep kosher, for instance, the McDonald's in, in Israel, you are not even able to get a cheeseburger at this point. And Jews go around, and I, I say this because I, I was a Jew, uh, and we, we would do these kind of things, and you look into it, and this comes from Deuteronomy, where the Canaanites are practicing these pagan ceremonies. And they're, one of these pagan ceremonies is they get a, a goat, right, a baby goat, and they boil this goat in its mother's milk. She's still nursing. Um, so they boil it oh, and they cook horrible. this Good. Yeah, it's super, super disgusting. And so God declares um, through, um, through, I guess, Moses at this time that do not do that because it's disgusting <laughs> and, and because it's a pagan thing. This was a, um, a practice as like a sacrifice to Baal, um, you know, back, back then. So that's how it was interpreted for a while. And then oh, when, they didn't like the pagans. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> what so the Jews after that get exiled to Babylon for a while. When they finally get back to Jerusalem, they're but they're were exiled because of their sin. God God allows these people to take over. And they get back and they are so determined not to sin anymore 
that they try to go a little bit harder. They call them fences. So it's laws that take you further away from being able to set. Not laws that God made, but you're even further away uh, from you don't the even sound. look at a sin. Yeah, you don't come close. So that's when one of these big brand rabbis, his descendants of the that scribe of Ezra, decides that, okay, you know what? What happens if you go to the market and you get a goat and then you go next door and they have milk and it was that goat's mom and then you cooked with that? Why, well, that would be a sin. And that's when they declare that there can be no uh, no mixing of any meat and any dairy. And then you get hundreds and hundreds of years later, and they start this nonsense that you need to get more and more plates so that these things never, ever touch. And when Jesus comes back, he says that he's not challenging any of the words of the Old Testament or, or the laws and the prophets at their time. He's mad about these man-made laws that have come out from these people that have nothing to do with God and totally miss the, the uh, opportunity to even connect it to anything God said. Uh, you know, when, when you have, when you have uh, those kind of things, so those laws about meat and dairy came so late that the Canaanites didn't even exist <laughs> at that point. So wow. that's why when you hear throughout the Bible, it is written, that's referring to the actual text. But when you hear, especially in the Sermon on the Mount or something, when he says it is said, and then he goes on to explain oh, uh, why not. I, another quick one um, is the thing about like divorce. So in the Old Testament, um, they have this thing that, all right, if you get divorced, you have to give your wife this certificate uh, just because a woman couldn't survive that at that point if she didn't have family or something or another husband. So they were sent away. People would still know they were married and these women were just dying of exposure or starvation because they had nothing. So when God offers this idea that you can get this certificate, it's just kind of mitigating the damage that is done to these poor women. And it's not saying, oh, there are reasons to divorce or that divorce isn't a sin. It's just trying to help out the poor unfortunate victims of these people. And you end up having the, the, the Mishnah writers and the rabbis making up all these reasons why people can get divorced. Because, oh, after all, he said they give them the certificate. So there must be a reason. The silliest one out there is that if a woman burns your soup, you can be oh you can divorce her. So it's really, it's really I wild. Don't need to write that. <laughs> they just, you know, they just, they were obsessed with writing. I think they got paid by the word. So somebody was really salty that his wife burned <laughs> his mouth one day with soup, and he was thinking oh. about it for the rest of his life. <laughs> for sure, for sure. It's like, yeah, like I hate them. this woman. <laughs> Because then you know what else? You know what else you can't tolerate? When they burn your soup. It and, probably uh, happens every day for dinner. It's like, <laughs> God damn, I told you not to make it so hot. <laughs> and they just, so they were looking for excuses. So it shows where the Jewish community is at this time. And a lot of this stuff still applies to this day. Because uh, they would, the rabbis kind of lied. And they would say, oh, this was oral law. This wasn't written law, but it was just stuff they were making. So they wanted to make themselves the best. They wanted to make themselves successful. They wanted to do everything in control. So they just made this stuff up and said it was the oral law. And you still have Jews to this day who abide by this oral law and think that it's the same thing as scripture. So that's really what Jesus was showing up to do. Um, so then we, we get back to the bar and we hear um, somebody call um, our, the woman we first met, uh, Lilith. 
which you know has a long history of the other wife of Adam and some uh, Jewish stories. It's not not a biblical thing, but it's interesting that they chose that because she's like an evil bad woman or something. Takes babies in the night. It's kind of an old evil Jewish <laughs> folktale. And we get to one of the older bartenders who's being very nice to the woman. You can see he knows her and makes her some kind of tonic. Somebody comes up and propositions Lilith, who we know, so you could see how men just felt comfortable doing whatever they wanted. It's, it's um, implied that she was raped at, at, di at different points. But this was a shunned, unclean woman and for different reasons. You see, later on in the story, you have um, somebody who is perpetually having like a menstrual blood. Uh, coming up, and you read about this uh, later on in the Bible, that like something is always coming out of her. And that made her unclean, so she had to like live away from town. Nobody would help her, nobody would touch her because she was unclean. And for Mary, for whatever reason, because she hung out with men, because she didn't subscribe to the same uh, things that all the other women were doing. She wasn't having her hair uh, covered. She was considered basically just untouchable. And she has, she seems like she has mental issues uh, in this, maybe like a schizophrenia or something. Um, we'll see. And um, she, uh, Jesus shows up, um, does what people have failed in the past to do, which is drive the demons out of her. He hugs her and he calls her by name, which is so important because that's what was in Isaiah. Um, you know, I call I call you by name, and we learn that that she is uh, Mary Magdalene, who you all know from our, from our Bibles, uh, and they have this hug, and she loves it, you know, and, and embrace. And you can all see. good after that. Yeah, and, she, and she's all and she's all good out of that. So um, that's that's our first episode um, there, and. Uh, yeah, I think I think we'll leave it at that. I'm not sure how I connected that to the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> For oh, I got, I got it, I got. It. So, <laughs> what's so interesting about the Dead Sea Scrolls here is that we saw that oral translation right in the beginning with Isaiah, and there's always that promise in the Bible that the word is never going to go away, that it's preserved. And now, when people come today and talk about the unreliable nature of the Jesus story, because a lot of it was written down fully 70, 80 years after his death. And they say, oh, they're playing telephone. You know, they're, and one thing we all remember being little kids and not being able to get through a room before somebody inserts something dirty into a message, and it keeps going. But now... We see that game of telephone, and it seemed to be very different because the what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the portions of the Old Testament, the Jewish holy texts uh, from them, was a thousand years older than any that we had currently um, up until that point. And they looked at it, and you must. Some people must have been thinking, "Oh man, what if this dramatically changes it? What if this thousand years really distorted it?" And what was so so amazing to me about it was that it was identical. It was kind of completely identical. So this oral uh, history that these Jews would pass on generation to generation, they took it very seriously, and the scribes took it very seriously. And they got a thousand years that those texts, now there were some additional ones that fell off, like the Book of Enoch. But as far as the text goes that were really uh, there, that they were able to check back and forth to each other, it was identical. So it shows you that, you can get thousands of years with it being perfect. So 70 in the, in the you know, is, is really not, not saying much at this time with how we see now proven that, that these words. Are I mean, do we even 100% know that it was only oral, though? Because 
with like history and archaeology, like they're always finding new stuff. Like there's no way that depending on what they were writing it on, it could have mm-hmm. just disintegrated and they had to keep rewriting it. And then yeah. finally at that age of writing, they had a certain kind of fabric or whatever that didn't disintegrate, you know, like that they could finally find. Because even with like, the dinosaurs are not 100% sure if they had feathers or whatever, because certain parts <laughs> don't fossilize. Yeah, so, for like, sure. We don't really know. They could have been having this all written down. They obviously had like writing at that time. Yeah, I think the scribes probably were doing something similar to that that just didn't last. I guess not, not a lot of things last a thousand years uh, for it. So it's uh, it's just interesting that you know, to make a new copy, you didn't have any printing press. And they had to rewrite every single word of it. And the Jewish language is very difficult because, you know, I think Arabic shares this, that we have pretty distinct letters in, in our alphabet. At that point, a little like jot at the very top would change it if it was angle different. There's some weird ones. So you'd imagine that the people who did that had a real impressive uh, impressive ability to, to recite. So that is our... Uh, <laughs> so that is our, our first episode. We're looking forward to, um, I think the next season's probably going to come out in six months or something. Hopefully we're able to uh, be caught up uh, by them. We're probably going to do two or three episodes uh, moving forward, but I wanted to do a deep dive into this first one. My favorite episode is the third, when Jesus is just hanging out with the kids. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I think that might be my favorite in the series. It's just so cute <laughs> with it, yeah. and and you see like the character of Jesus not connected to this mission. That's kind of his like final time to just cut loose for a minute before all the craziness ensues, and just gets get the chance to you know just be the nice guy. We all uh, we all know. <laughs> I like how the actor that they got to play Jesus just has like a very wholesome energy. You know, like that's the kind of energy you would have expected. Yeah. Oh, he's perfect. He's definitely perfect. And so many other movies, when we see a Jesus character, it just seemed very weird. Um, they didn't have that human quality. It almost seemed like a god that he would just stand and say everything perfectly. Uh, this is, that definitely captures the the Jesus that we know in the Gospels. And like you said, his face is just like nice. <laughs> so I think that will wrap it up uh, for uh, our, our chosen. But make sure to like and subscribe and uh, get us to the next time right there. <laughs>